Today, my topic is going to be on how to recognize figures of speech. You know, there's two ways that God uh, brings emphasis to a verse of Scripture, and Grace covered uh, one of them, which is, you know, the customs, idioms, so on and so forth, everything she covered. The other is by figures of speech. And we're going to take a look at that today. And uh, oh, that's the next slide. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read a quote from Dr. Werrell, who, who taught the foundational class. He said, figures of speech used in God's word are God's own markings of the scriptures as to what he considers important. And I'm going to read that again. And um, I made it easy for you today, too. A lot of my notes are going to be on the screen, so you don't have to scramble. But figures of speech used in God's word are God's own markings of the scriptures as to what he considers important. And um, well, that's not me up there. <laughs> <laughs> but we've all heard that expression, lend me your ears. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I, I can't do that for you, but it's a figure of speech. And it happens to be the figure of speech metonymy, which, uh, but you'll see, I'm going to cover some figures of speech in the census realm, and then we'll look at obviously some in, in God's Word. But in, today what I'm going to be covering is a brief overview of figures of speech. We're going to look at whether or not it's something is literal or figurative. And then I'm going to cover uh, the three classifications, omission, addition, and change. Um, so you get, a again, a brief. You could spend a lifetime going through this book and the books that... Uh, well, that makes it sound like it's a, a tough situation. It's really not. It's simplified because there are so many things that you can reference to look up and get an understanding. So, but let me ask you a question. If you were writing a letter or an email, what would you do to emphasize something you were writing in the email or the letter? Capitalize. Capitalize. Punctuation. Punctuation. Exclamation, bold. Now I want you to pay attention because throughout my teaching you're going to see a lot of that. Whether I've used different colors or uh, capitalization or good looking uh, pictures of people on the... Uh... <laughs> but you're right. see, if you wanted to emphasize something in your letter, what would you do? You'd capitalize, you underline bold letters, different colors, pictures... There's a, a lot of different things that you could do. And it'd be easy for them to know what you wanted to uh, emphasize, right? Would that make sense? I mean, if I, um, I mean, the first word on the top is capitalized. So we're looking at the word overview. I know you looked at it when, when it came up. But so here's God. You have the original Hebrew and Greek. And it's all written in capital letters, no punctuation. All letters were together. Let me just show you what that looks like. Right. So, um, fortunately, we don't have to look at that. How do I go back? There we go. So, what does God do? So, how does God emphasize? How do we know what God wants us to know and what is important? When God wanted to emphasize something of importance, He used Grace's topic and He used figures of speech. Figures of speech are used with precision by God in His Word. They add emphasis to what is, what is being stated and what is important to God. So let's take our Bibles and go to <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3. Oh, there's a different color there, red. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, you know what today is really cool? I get to see things through, through Pat Malone's eyes. Why? These are his glasses. <laughs> so I get to see what he's all about. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture... How many of the scriptures? Oh. All of them. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, truly perfected unto all good works. That word there is the word theopanustos, man. That the God's word is all God breathed. And one of Nick's scripts, uh, verses that he used today, which we'll, go, we'll look at again, in uh, Psalm 138.2, God said he magnified his what? Word. His word above his what? Name. name. Think about that. His word is above his name. So do you think it's good? Yes. You think it's perfect? You think it means something? I think so. So the word, the entire word of God is given for this purpose, which is profitable for right believing, where we were believing wrong, and it is all for instruction in rightness, righteousness. The word of God is to be accepted literally wherever possible. Romans 10. Could, um, what's your name? Dylan. <laughs> Dylan, you want to read Romans 10, 9 and 10 for me? Sure. Nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. <laughs> Romans 10, 9 and 10, or just 9? 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Is that literal or figurative? Literal. I'll give you the answer. Thank God it is. Thank God that Romans 10, 9 and 10 is the doorway to eternal life. No, Led Zeppelin did Stairway to Heaven. No, yeah. Romans 10, 9, and 10. That's going to get you eternal life. And God made it simple, and He made it literal, that we could just read it and choose to believe it. And we could choose because we have free will. But you do that, and you're going to heaven. God is perfect, therefore His Word is perfect. Words in the Word, in correct order, are perfect. His use of figures of speech in the word is perfect. God has a purpose. Look in Psalm chapter 12. Verse 6. It says, The words of the Lord are what? <laughs> Pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You know, it's purified seven times, but the word is perfect. It's pure. I mean, that's the only thing I really know that's pure, is God's word. And, you know, Pat shared about his Bible up in the attic. Mine was, I had this huge Catholic Bible that was on a, on a table, in, in sight, full of dust. Yeah. And I did the same thing at one point in my life, tried to open it up and and start to read it, and I just, I, I hurt my head. I hurt my brain. I just couldn't do it. And, uh, but look in Psalm 119. In 161, it says, Princes have per persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 13, it says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the <coughs> Holy Ghost, the Spirit, teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I mean, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Ooh, Foolishness. God's word is pure. Natural man's words, I mean, he could speak uh, God's word, and that's good. But it's foolishness unto him. But we, we go by and walk by the Spirit so that we can... I'm not going to go there. Look, Psalm 138 says, For I have magnified my, thy word above all thy name. Figures of speech in the word are perfect. Okay? They're a key to words interpretation in the verse. Does anybody have a set of keys here in their pocket that I could just have for a moment? There you go. I 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, so let's picture that. I belong to the Y too. Um, you're home, going home at night. It's late. You pull out your keys. She only has uh, one key, but there's other things going on here. But let's say there was a bunch of, a bunch of keys there. You'd be stumbling around looking for the right key to open up that door. You and I have been given the right keys to open up the door, right? We have, we have the right key to open up the doors. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 10. And we've been taught keys to unlock the scripture. The word interprets itself in three ways. Who remembers the first one? In the verse. In the context. And where it was used before, right? So we've been given the keys on how to interpret the, the Word of God. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 17, it says, So then faith, believing, cometh by what? Hear hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Yeah. Right? Faith, believing, comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. We hear so that we can do what? Believe. Mm -hmm. Right? And the Word of God helps us to get back on track where we might have been believing wrong. How many of you have seen uh, sports figures? Right? When you're watching football, you see all these sports figures. What about political figures? Right? They're figures that draw attention to us, for us, right? to them. So uh, they stand out. Figures call, figures call us to attention. And what figures do we see? How about anybody ever go into that store, Toys R Us? And what do you see when you look at that sign? Action figures. Well, think about, think about the words up there. What do you see? The R. Is you, so you see the R backwards. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Brings attention, mm -hmm. right? So there are different things, billboards. When you buy a car, now I, I bought a car a year ago, and I never thought about it much. But wouldn't, wouldn't you know it now when I'm on the road, it's like every other car is a Nissan Rogue? Yeah. <laughs> right? It brings attention to things. So what figures do you see? Uh, and uh, they, they call attention. So what does God do? Let's look in Luke chapter 4. And Amanda, would you go to Matthew chapter 4? In Luke chapter 4, verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Would you read Matthew 4, 4 for me, Amanda? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, does that verse of Scripture, similar verses, right? Mm -hmm. But which one brought more emphasis the one that abandoned right there every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god now does god have a mouth no he's spirit right but that verse of scripture brings attention to what was just said which is pretty cool i wouldn't have thought of that it's a good thing god did uh and that figure there is the figure condescensio it's the same truth but one adds emphasis let's look at psalm 136 The whole, now the whole chapter, we're not going to read the whole chapter. Let's just look at the first couple of verses. Verse 1 says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 2, O give thanks unto God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. <coughs> o give thanks to the Lord of, of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, again, figures of speech and orientalisms, customs, idioms. It's like that billboard. It brings attention. It's to, it's to catch your attention because something good is going to be said. So this figure here, um, 
is the figure, well, it's actually two figures of speech because there's one in the beginning and one at the end. But the one we're looking at is anaphora, two separate phrases used. In the beginning, it says, oh, give thanks. And the second part of the scripture says, for mercy endureth forever. And the other, the other figure of speech is epistrophe. So there's two separate, fi- two separate phrases used. Figures of speech in the beginning and at the end. And uh, again, it's all to bring attention, to bring emphasis. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. So my keychain has one key on it, just so you know. <laughs> and I have a keypad on my garage door because I, you know, she only has one key too. Acts chapter 2, verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Now here we are reading in Acts. Was David living in during the time of Acts? No, no he wasn't. He lived a long time ago. Right? More than 60 years ago. And, uh, but, so why is this here? Again, it's to bring emphasis. Let's read the rest of it. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, and he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. But it said, for David, David speaketh. And again, is there emphasis there as soon as you see David's name? Because we know he's not living in that particular time. So it's to bring emphasis so that we... You know, our eyes should open up so that we can pay attention to what's being said. Look at Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew 5, verse 29, it says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. I remember the first time I saw this verse. I was like, wait a minute, time out. You know, I need these two. You know, but it says, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30, And if thy right hand, here we go, If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should not be cast. That's the, that's the figure of speech, hyperbole. And it's figurative, and it's, it's the, it brought attention, it brought exaggeration, right? That's pretty exaggerated. If, you're, if, I, if your eye offend thee, cut it out. That's really exaggerating something. I don't think that's what God wants us to do. And uh, it says that that, that, verse, that uh, figure of speech implied Exaggeration, but resemblance or representation. The right eye is compared by implication to the most highly prized possession, your eyes. So there's a lot of emphasis there. Look at John chapter 11. In verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with his hair, her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. Now if somebody came up to you and said, hey, you know, your brother is sick, you know, he, that person probably couldn't get all the words out of their mouth before you'd be taking off to go to where your brother was. But Jesus Christ says, what did he do? It says he abode two more days uh, still in the same place. And one of the great things about Jesus Christ, when you're, when you're studying the Word of God, He did His Father's will. He did the will of God. So here God's telling Him, hey, you got this, you don't have to go. And He stayed two, two more days. 
What do you think the disciples were thinking? He always did the Father's will. Verse 7, that after that he saith he, he, he to his disciples, let us go into Judas again, Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? So here they are, they're going, there's danger there, right? They look to stone him, uh, and they wanted to kill him, but he listened to God, and he waited two more days. Look in verse 9. It says, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? For if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake awake him out of sleep. <laughs> he was sleeping. That's what Jesus Christ said. And then said his disciples, Lord, if he's asleep, he shall do well. The disciples obviously didn't pick up on the figure of speech that Jesus Christ was using at that particular time. And they didn't understand the figure of speech. And that figure of speech was a euphemism. It's a figure where a harsh or disagreeable expression is changed to a pleasant and an agreeable one. Look in Jeremiah chapter 15. In verse 16, it says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by the names, name, O Lord, God of hosts. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Did he, did he eat the word? No. It's a figure of speech. Polylipton. And it's a repetition of the same part of speech in a different inflection. <laughs> so, and what is that? It, 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 it's explained in the rest of the verse. It, it explains the figure and the emphasis. The figure makes it stronger, more powerful, the more we train our eye to this word, the strong we will get. And again, I, I was listening to Grace's teaching and, and Nick, and you know, I've been around, you know, me and Moses were like this. <laughs> I've been around a while, and I listened to those two teachings today, and I went, oh my God, you know, uh, what, what good stuff. And the things that are available to us, and again, what God puts emphasis on and brings a stronger inflection for us to understand, that's a big deal. So, God has a purpose for everything He says, where He says it, why He says it, how He says it, to whom He says it, and when He says it. I put that in red so that hopefully it um, brings your uh, attention to it. To have a perfect word, the words must be perfect. And the order of the words must be perfect. Look in Matthew chapter 5. Now you don't even need to do it. But it's, that ver it's the verse of scriptures that blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. Right? A bunch of repetition with the same phrase. Uh, it's, the, it's the figure anaphora. Like sentence beginnings. So figures of speech are the basis of all true translation interpretation and understanding of the scriptures. And this is again from Dr. Worrell. For years I had asked myself the question, what's really important in the scriptures? And I finally discovered that whatever God wanted to emphasize beyond the literal sense, usage and understanding of the words, he put into it a figure of speech. That was good of him. Thus, the figure of speech used in God's word are, are God's own markings for the scriptures as to what he considers important. There is no branch or subject of the Bible study more important than figures of speech. Yet I know of no branch of study which has been so severely neglected. Since all of God's words are perfect and his word is one of his works, perhaps the greatest, and we saw that in Psalm 138, it must also be perfect. God magnified his word above all his name. And uh, that's a that's and Doctor World knew what he was talking about. He was a great man of God who studied the scriptures and had people around him who studied it along with him to help uh, in their understanding. So, 
It's great. We want to understand God's word so that we can believe. And when we, when we do that, we please God. Anybody, anybody here want to please God? Yes. yes, we all do. So we ought to take God's word literally wherever and whenever possible. Now, Grace was talking about it. And, you know, when something seems unusual, you know, some people will take something that's a figure, that's figurative, and like go, I don't understand. But when something seems unusual in the word, it usually is one of these two subjects, right? And then it's worth picking up a, one of the uh, reference books to look it up because there are, and again, for me, I can only speak for myself, this person here, E.W. Bullinger, that's him, this is me. But the good news is <coughs> I can go like this and pick up this book. So I don't need to know everything. He's done it for us. Lamza has done it for us. So all we have to do is, is to pick up and, and go to our reference materials to find out what's being said. So where to take it? He uses figures of speech to communicate his truth. The use of figures of speech places where sometimes it is said, which is not literal or goes outside of the normal rules of language. All right? That's a flag. You don't have to get upset over that. If, if, it, if you don't understand it, then you pull out one of your reference books. And it's a key to the word's interpretation in the verse because it is how God highlights what is important in his word. So what is a figure of speech? And by the way, there's over 200 different figures of speech in God's word, and many of them have 30 to 40 different varieties. Again, that's up here, I'm here, but I have this. So that puts me up there too. And not, not that word that Nick spoke about that Dylan used, that Spanish word. <laughs> That's not me, like I'm up there, that's, I'm like, phew. So what is a figure of speech? A departure from normal rules of grammar or word usage. It is simply a word or a sentence thrown into a peculiar, peculiar, peculiar form, different from its original or simplest meaning or use. Figures of speech are the Holy Spirit's marking as to what is important and is to be emphasized in the word. The natural man cannot understand the word of God. It is foolishness unto him. So we are dealing with words that the Holy Spirit teaches us. All these words are perfect. Most errors arise from either taking literally that which is figurative or taking figuratively that which is literal. You can't, you can't call something figurative because you don't understand it. So how do we know? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Literal or figurative. Remember, the word is to be accepted literally whenever and wherever possible. Last night, last night I was so hungry I ate like a... A what? King. A horse. Pig. Last night I was so hungry I ate like a pig. Figure of speech, right? So a fi Now, is it literal? No. A figure may not be true to fact, but li listen to this, but it is true to feeling and true to truth. We may say the ground needs rain. That is plain. It's a cold statement of fact. But if you were to say the ground is thirsty, that brings emphasis to that, right? When I, when I say that the ground is thirsty, I think of like the desert and how the dirt, you see all the cracks or a dried up riverbed. Mm -hmm. I get the impression that it's thirsty. So we have now used a figure of speech, not true to fact, but true to reality and to feeling but full of warmth, giving emphasis. So it let the mountains will sing. Now, do mountains sing? No. 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 So that's figurative. The crops suffer. Nope. Uh, hard heart. We've heard people about uh, people has a hard heart. The kettle boils. So we don't mean that the kettle is boiling, but literally the water inside the kettle is boiling. And these are all figures of speech, right? So the ground needs rain. That's literal. The ground is thirsty. That's figurative. And again, I was so hungry last night, I ate like a pig. And that's the word, that's the figure of speech, a simile, which using the words like or as. So let's take a look at some literal or figurative. Someone go to John chapter 11. Rita. Yes. Please. I'm there. 
Verse 35, the longest verse of scripture in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. Just to give you my picture, is a picture of... I mean, that's a sad verse of scripture. The thought that the Son of God wept. But is that liter literal or figurative? Literal. literal. Uh, someone go to Isaiah 55. Nick, would you do that for me? Isaiah 55, 12? Yes. Uh, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Right, the trees clap their hands. Now, is that literal or figurative? Figurative. Exactly. Ephesians chapter 5. Grace, you want to do that? Verse 20. Literal or figurative? Literal. Literal, right? And Psalm 17. Uh, Mike? Eight. Yes. Psalm 17, 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Keep me as the apple of thy eye. Is that literal or figurative? Figurative. 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 But just think about that for a moment. We're the apple of God's eye. Mm. You're the apple of God's eye. Mm. Dylan, Amanda, you, mm. even with Doya, you, you're the apple of God's eye. Mm. Don't ever forget that, okay? Mm. Hmm. So how do we know when we are looking at a figure of speech and when we are, um, when, and when we are, how do we identify what a figure of speech it is? Again, when a statement appears to be contrary to our experience or to a known fact or to the general teaching of truth, then we can expect that a figure of speech is present. And if it is a figure of speech, then that figure can be named and described. It will have a specific identifiable purpose. So how do we identify a figure of speech in question? Boom. So this great research book that is by E.W. Bullinger is... I'll be honest with you, and I shared this with Pat. When I first got in the Word, I mean, this book, it was scary to me. It was like, this is way, way... Oh, you've been there. <laughs> yeah. It was way over my head. I just, like, I, I can't do this, you know. I'm just happy to do Jesus Wept. You know, simple and to the point. So, but... And let me, let me just back up a minute. This has got nothing to do with figures of speech. But when I got into the Word, somebody witnessed to me, and I was, in my, I was only 20, 25, and brought me to a, a fellowship, a Bible fellowship. And it was all young people. There were some older people, like 35, 40, <laughs> you know, at the time that was ancient. But I got to sit and listen to somebody teach the Bible. Just, and that's why I did this too, because I wanted to show you out of the Word that Everything I just show, share with you out of the Word, you can go back later when I'm not here, and it'll still say the same thing. And that's what I loved about it, that it wasn't somebody telling me what to do, when to do it, how to do it. It was in the Word of God that I could read it for myself, and I could make a decision on my own, because I do have free will. And that, to me, was like such an eye-opener, and I just, I never stopped going after that. I went that first time, and that was it, and that was... Back in 1975, some of you were way from being born, but <laughs> way back when, and well, how thankful I am that I, I had to go there. But anyway, back to E.W. Bullinger. So I'm going to show you how we look up uh, the verse of Scripture, and I, I, I mean a figure of speech. And I pick the first figure of speech in the Bible, which I figured be a good place. I figured be a good place to start. So if you, if you wanted to look up a verse of Scripture in Bullinger, in the back on 1032, there is an index. And as you can see, it's right there, Index of Texts and Passages. And if you look at the first line, it says Genesis, and there it is, Genesis verse 1 and verse 2. And it tells you what page to go to. It says page two, 251. Well, let me, let me just meander on over there. Come in. One of those kids, that is. 
wonder whose mom that was that made that sound. Um, but the first figure of speech is in the word is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Would somebody read it for me? Rita, you can go again, Rita. Okay. Okay, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved <coughs> upon the face of the waters. Great. So we're reading that verse of Scripture, and it's, you know, it's making you think, maybe I should look this up. So I went to Bullinger in the back. There's an index of all the, which we looked at. Went to page 251. So here am I at 251, and I go down the page, and there it is, Genesis 1. And I know you can't read it as well on that, on that slide. But it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became without form and void. Thus, Anadiplosis is the very first figure employed in the Bible. And it is used to call our attention to and emphasize the fact that while the first statement refers to two things, the heaven and the earth, the following statement proceeds to speak of only one of them, leaving the other entirely out of consideration. Both are created at the beginning, but the earth is at some time and by some means and from some cause became a ruin, empty, waste, and desolate. Now, how cool is that? That I mean, that I wouldn't be able to figure that out, but here's a gentleman that did. And that, it's very simple. You can see how simple that was to find that figure of speech and to identify it. And it's really clear here. You can see Genesis chapter 1, 1 and 2. And it happens to be on the first page. So it has the definition of that figure of speech, which is great. So you can see that this is figurative and not literal. To get an understanding of the verse, you would go to the index, which we just did, look up the verse, and then see, and then go to the page indicated to see what figure of speech it is. It's used here to get an understanding of what the emphasis is. And now we can, and this is important, now we get a correct interpretation of the scripture and not a misinterpretation. Mm-hmm. So you can see we, we, we just looked at it literal, whether something is literal or figurative. The last thing that I want to cover is the classifications of figures of speech. And again, Bullinger, where did I get that from? Well, I went to the, the beginning. And right there, <clears throat> it says... Summary of classification. Wow, this is my speed. <laughs> and then it lists, it lists the three classifications of figures of speech. And we're going to look at them briefly. We could spend a long time going into all the different figures of speech. But we're going to look at a couple of each of the classifications. And the study of figure of speech is complex because of the number of languages. Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, English involved and because each language has many figures but the patterns of language are so universally common to mankind that most of the figures of speech cross over from language to language in a recognizable way various scholars through the centuries have offered systems of classifying figures of speech but the clearest and best documented is by e.w bullinger and is where we get these different classifications from So the first one is figures of speech involving omission, words or meaning left out. So affecting words, grammar or sentence structure. And the first figure of speech we're going to look at is ellipsis. And these are words that are left out and to be supplied from nature of subject. And in Matthew chapter 11, Verse 18, it says, For John came together neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. Oh, well. <laughs> he didn't eat or drink, so he has a devil? No. Uh, in 18, it says, For John came neither eating nor drinking. And it was, it's talking about that he, d- he didn't come to eat or drink with others. Being human, John had to eat and drink. So what is left out is a declining invitation to eat with others. And that's the figure of speech ellipsis. Look in uh, Acts chapter 5. Verse 
So this is affecting the, the same sense, the meaning. In, in uh, Acts chapter 5, In verse 36, it says, For, for before these days rode up, uh, well, whatever that person's name is, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. But what I want to look at is the first part. He was boasting himself to be somebody. And that is... Um, it was a lessening of a thing that the, the figure is tapinosis, a lessening of a thing in order to increase it. So he came boasting himself to be somebody, claiming, claiming himself to be somebody, meaning somebody great. Okay, so there's emphasis there. And uh, again, we could look up many, many different figures of speech involving omission. But again, we're not going to do that. So let's look at the next one. Figures involving addition. Words or meanings inserted. And uh, let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 40, verse 1, it says, Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people, saith your God. But there's a repetition of, a, or a duplication of the same word in a sentence. Comfort ye, comfort ye. So there's something that's said twice. So it should bring attention to what is going to be said. Okay? And that's the, the that verse, uh, that figure of speech. Look in John chapter 1. In 51, it says, And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you. I mean, he could have said the word once, but he didn't. He said it twice. Verily, verily, I say unto you. So, the figure of speech that are affecting words, and there's a, a couple of figures there, anaphora, polysyndeton, and again, you want to get a good understanding, pull up the Bible. There's also an alphabetical listing of all the figures of speech. So let's say today... I'm not going to cover polysyndetin, but you want to know what it's all about. You go to the back of this book in E.W. Bullinger, and alphabetically, it will show you all the figures of speech. Can't fool me. I went to the P's, polysyndetin, and I knew that it was a P. So I looked it up, and it tells you where to go to get a good understanding, a good definition of that figure of, of speech. Uh, let's look at Second, Second Samuel chapter 1. Dylan, you want to go there for me? Sure. And read verse 23. 2 Samuel 1, 23. Yep. Please. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, and they were stronger than lions. Mm. Now, is that literal or figurative? Figurative. figurative. That's the, the figure of speech, hyperbole, and it means exaggeration. So they were, God was exaggerating that about Jonathan and, uh, and Saul. So, again, if that's a verse of Scripture that get your attention, go to Bullinger's, go back to the index, look up 2 Samuel, go to chapter 1, slide down, look at verse 23, it'll tell you what page to go to. You go to that page in Bullinger, you'll see that verse of scripture. If it's not on the first page of the definition of that um, figure of speech, you just back up a couple of pages until that you see where that figure of speech specifically starts, and then you can see the definition uh, 
and the meaning of it. And the third one is figures involving change, words or meaning changed. A change affecting the meaning, use, use arrangement, and order. Metonymy is a figure by which one name or noun is used instead of another. Let's look in Proverbs chapter 20. I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 10. In verse 20, it says, The tongues of the just is a choice. Am I in the right one? Yep, Proverbs. Um, the tongues of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is a little worth. Now, it's talking about the tongue. Is this literal or figurative? Figurative. figurative. So, what that, I don't understand that meaning and what it meant, but what it means is it's about emphasizing the words or the speech. That's what the tongue is, is doing. Of the righteous is a choice silver. Look in Matthew chapter 6. My go-to person, Ruth. Uh, <laughs> verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's talking about thoughts and affections. Okay, that's what will be there also. And it's, the, again, the figure of speech metonymy. It's a figure by which one name or noun is used instead of another. And uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just so thankful that after doing this, and I was talking with Nick and I were talking the other day. I mean, who got the mo who, who's going to get the most out of this? this uh, subject today? Me, because I did the most research and mm -hmm. spent a lot of time. Pat gave us enough time to, so I learned a lot. I mean, it's not all in this presentation, but I learned a lot. And you'll find that when you do things like that, you'll learn the most as the researcher. Mm -hmm. But let's take, we'll, we'll just, as a refresher, let's go back and take a look at Proverbs 10 and verse 20 and how I got there. You know, the top part of the page is cut off, but I went to the, to the index in the back and I looked up Proverbs chapter 10. And if you can see it up there, if you just slide down to the, to the bottom, you'll see chapter 10. And then if you slide down, you'll see verse 20. And then it tells me to go to page 546 in this book. And the second page is, if you look, you'll see Proverbs 10.20 on there. So you get to read it, and it says the tongue, which is talking about words of, or speech. And then I go to the, I had to back up and look up metonymy because it wasn't on, I mean, it was on that page, but I had to go back to the original page where it started to find the meaning. And on that page, uh, it had the meaning of metonymy. And uh, which makes it, now this book is, is a lot simpler than when I first looked at this book years ago, and it, it scared the heck out of me. Now, to me, it's a friend. <laughs> it's a tool. And I know some, somewhere today we're going to be hearing about different tools, but it's a tool for me to, to look at. So in conclusion today, what is a figure of speech? It's a departure from the normal rules of grammar or word usage. What is, its, what is the purpose? to give special emphasis to call attention to a point. And why are figures in the Bible? God used figures of speech to call attention to a point in, in the scriptures. And why are they important? To get correct interpretation of the scripture, because we want to study to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word, right? We don't want to misinterpret it. And what sh when should they be taken literally or figuratively? God's word should be understood literally whenever possible. And how do we recognize a figure of speech? When the words do not make sense. <laughs> so today we looked at, and there's another one, hyperbole. My backpack weighs a ton. I tell you, some of the kids on the school bus, like they come up the steps and they're like leaning back because their backpacks are so heavy. I'm a bus driver.
So in conclusion, we looked at a brief overview of figures of speech today. We took a look at whether it was literal or figurative. And the three classifications, remember the first is omissions, the second was additions, and the third was change. And I'll close by reading another quote by Dr. Werwell. It says, there is no branch or subject of the Bible study more important than figures of speech. Yet I know of no branch of study which has been so severely neglected. Since all of God's words works are perfect, and his word is one of his works, perhaps the greatest of all his works, it must also be perfect. God magnified his word above all his name. So hopefully today this you know, opens up your eyes just a little bit more and gives you another avenue to study God's word and get a better understanding. Why? So that we can believe more, right? Faith comes by hearing, believing comes by hearing, so that we can believe rightly and not believe wrongly. Get us back into believing rightly. So hopefully uh, this helped you today and thank you for listening and being a part of this great day. So God bless you. Thank you.